Good evening. As I walked into this space tonight, my eyes were drawn to a painting that I think is one of the world's most powerful and beautiful. And I'm talking about Gulumbu Unipingu's star painting. I have one in my home on bark because in its magnificent meditative simplicity and also in its scope, it is so vast. For me, that painting of our universe captures everything that exists, all that we know. And this, to me, is one of the daring themes of Art and Soul, the series, and this exhibition. It's daring to try to paint the great continuum with no beginning and no end. The stories that are here in this magnificent art so close to us tonight, I can only say I'm in awe of all that's been handed down to us by those that I call the children of the sunrise. I'm thankful to the Gadigal people, the ancestors who still own this land on which we're gathered tonight. And I'm thankful to some Aboriginal elders that I know are here this evening and some that have traveled from other parts of the country for actually sharing with all of us this way of seeing and listening. The art of listening is something our nation needs to practice. I've noticed that only the most intelligent men and women that I've met traveling the world now for over 50 years seem to know how to listen. And the Aboriginal art of listening to the earth singing beneath your feet, to practice how to be silent long enough to empty your head of your own cultural baggage before you can begin to entertain the new, the new way of seeing and listening. This is so important. If you have any doubts about the great value, the eternal value and beauty and power of the indigenous knowledge system, you really only have to look around the world. In my travels, yes, I've probably seen a lot of the destruction, the heavy footprints of humans almost everywhere that I've been. If you think about it, through the past century, somewhere between 160 and 180 million people have been killed in conflict, making it in one sense the most bloody century in human history. And yet we've begun this new millennium, a new century, the same way, more bloodshed. It is to me, from what I've seen, from the 30 odd conflicts that I've been to, as if we are not only at war with one another, we're at war with the earth itself. And I paint this bleak picture for an important reason, to understand the essence of Aboriginal art and the great power and value of this knowledge system is to help us see what is now out of balance. If you open your eyes, you will see the damage that has been done, this heavy footprint. You can see that already, according to the World Bank, we have about a billion people every day hungry. We have another half a billion members of the human family who can't find enough water each day. And yet, in a very short amount of time, by 2050, we will need to produce 75% more food to feed almost 9 billion human beings. This heavy footprint I've seen on every continent that I've been to. 
even at the top of the Himalayas, watching India and Pakistan have an insane war in this place so beautiful you felt it belonged to the angels. Even in Antarctica, the last great white wilderness, you see this damaging, heavy footprint caused by our species. And I came to see that while this destruction seems inevitable, as a sentient species, we do have a choice. This is what Aboriginal knowledge is trying to share with us, a way to put life, the connectedness of all things, into balance. We are now looking at a time, our children's lifetime, where only in the next few decades we will see up to a third of living species driven towards extinction. Think of 7,000 of the world's 10,000 types of birds becoming extinct. 50,000 of the world's 250,000 kinds of plants becoming extinct. And yet in New York a couple of weeks ago, James Cameron, the director of the movie Avatar, said to me, you're underestimating this. These are conservative measurements. A more likely species cull is up to two-thirds of current species driven to extinction by the end of this century. Life is out of kilter. And one of the world's acknowledged experts on this species extinction, Richard Leakey, tells us from the fossil evidence that what we are now in the midst of is the world's sixth period of mass extinction. What is different about this one? We, humans, are the predator that is driving this extinction. Life is out of kilter. The fragility of our interconnected living biosphere is something that is understood in the longer timelines of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledge. The reason this culture is so strong, resilient and relevant, is that it gives us the value system. Through the Aboriginal cultural view, it's not only our Prime Minister, it's not only the politicians or a few self-appointed leaders on any front, it's not only the miners, the farmers, the cotton growers, the irrigators, or whole communities up and down our rivers who are responsible for this balance. Every man, woman, and child in the Aboriginal concept has a role and a responsibility to contribute to the well-being not only of ourselves, our family, our community, but to the future generations. It is as if you're looking up and down the river for people living now and the children to come, the children of tomorrow's sunrise. This is the great power, the beauty and the value of the Aboriginal knowledge system. I've marvelled myself in that 50 years of world wandering at seeing how close to the most brilliant earth science the indigenous knowledge system actually is. Because in the way a scientist is thinking ahead to what will be the health of not only the world for our species, but all of the interconnected species that depend on this healthy biosphere, that is indeed what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledge is doing. It is connecting us to everything, everything that is alive around you. It is understanding the past, the present, and the future. So I say, give yourselves the time to think. Listen to the land speak to you. It's right beneath your feet. If you can learn to be silent, practice the art of listening, I think we will then begin to hear what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people 
have been saying to us very gently for a very long time. It is the things that are expressed through the wonderful storytelling power of some of this art that has been gathered into the Art and Soul exhibition. Hetty Perkins and Warwick Thornton have given Australia and the world a very deep, meaningful pathway into what it means to be truly here, into what it means to be truly Australian. I know only in the past few weeks being abroad, that it is the view of many people around the world that we are an Aboriginal country that has this hybrid, multicultural, new world heritage. When I was in New York, meeting with many First Nations leaders there, including two former presidents and a wonderful Guatemalan lady, Rigoberta Menchu, won the Nobel Prize for Peace for defending the last indigenous majority in the Americas, in tiny Guatemala. And through their eyes, not only do they see this as an Aboriginal country with a new world multicultural heritage, they were affronted to discover in the last few years that we had returned to what seemed to them to be a very old kind of assimilation the denial of the beauty and power and value of this culture represented in this exhibition. The truth is that the onslaught on Aboriginal culture by those culture war warriors is very crude, tasteless. It has taken us back to where we were many, many decades ago in this country. You will hear the phrase spoken by some anthropologists about renovating indigenous culture. It is such an offensive and tasteless expression that I would put in the same category as that misleading phrase, tough love, because these assaults on indigenous culture, and that's what they are, are in fact just another degree of social engineering that aims ultimately at cultural whitewash. The new assimilation is the same as the old assimilation. It's pushing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are already on the margins of survival. It's pushing them to the edge of obliteration. Its aim is to renovate, change, or erase the culture. And to do that, you must deny them their most important human rights. All of those magnificent pledges we've made to observe in the Declaration on Indigenous Rights, the rights of the child, the rights to cultural autonomy, the right to speak your own language and practice your own spirituality, all of those promises are empty and our pledges are hypocritical until we allow people to be who they really are. We are pushing on with a very dangerous kind of assimilation that can only end in the same pain that we have seen of the past. If we want the intention of the apology to be carried through to a brighter, fairer, more hopeful country, then we have to allow Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to truly practice their culture, their languages, teach their children in their languages. And my point is, we must see that our children, my children, also know this story and have the same deep, heartfelt respect for all that is important to be here in this place. Once you discover the beauty, once you open your eyes and you see, as Warwick Thornton and Hetty have in this series, you start to realise the great power, the beauty of what is here on offer for us. You are hearing what Aboriginal people have been saying to us. You are starting to feel you belong here. 
these themes in Art and Soul, this sense of belonging, the extraordinary sense of place, and let's not forget the people. In each one of these paintings, there is a life or many lives. And through that television series and this exhibition, these people for me become truly memorable, every one of them. My own involvement with Aboriginal people for most of my life is really, in my own mind, expressed the same way. It is about people and place an indelible connection. It is understanding in the Aboriginal sense that you are of this place. This kind of custodianship is like earth science because although it gives us that responsibility to look after that local place and it gives you that sentient role, there's a great humility about it because in the Aboriginal view, you don't elevate yourself above any of the other creatures in this wonderful, natural, living, miraculous world. We are part of the whole. This is the connectedness that I speak of. And it's expressed so powerfully to me in this exhibition. I relate to it perhaps because coming home from any one of those terrible wars that I went to, I know I would look at Kim, my wife, in a way that I could only be thankful to just be walking and talking and breathing. If I went to Antarctica, crossing that white wilderness in a place that had no other life, with six fellas from six different nations trying to find out what they had in common, and a bunch of sweaty huskies, I would come back from that place as if I'd fallen from one of Gulumbu Yunapingu's stars. And I would look at my family and at every living thing that I saw with this intensity of connectedness. That is what Aboriginal art invites us to share about being here. It is the connectedness of everyone, of every living creature. It is an entirely different view of humanity. It is a humble view, but at the same time, it's quite awesome. I've learned as a storyteller to empty my head of intellectual pretense and to be open to the new ways that people will try and convey to you these things that are sacred, that are intimate, that are happening all around us, but often we've closed our mind to them. An example would be up north, there's a very old story called the Children of the Great Lake. It in fact was created at a time when Australia and Papua New Guinea were virtually still joined and the sea was so shallow. So in fact, it's a story that Earth science would tell us has a realistic time frame. Earth science would say, yes, we have plate tectonics and the continents are drifting. The one we're sitting on is still moving north towards China at about the length of your fingernail every year. Imperceptible to the human mind and eye, perhaps, but within this Aboriginal concept of the journeying, easily understood, an abstraction that Aboriginal people have no trouble dealing with, the journey of the earth. So that story could be 15,000 years old, at least. No one really knows who's to say. But the connection to the movement of the earth is this. So much of Aboriginal art, storytelling, and knowledge is in fact the human journey of the mind trying to explore our relationship to the cosmos. Where are we? Who are we? What connects us all? That is the great beauty of that story, The Children of the Sunrise. You could wander further 
If you set out from Alice Springs and you travel north a long way, then you turn left at Rabbit's Flat and you cross the Great Sandy Desert and out somewhere out the back of Billy Luna Aboriginal Station, which is now in Western Australia, we've gone that far west, you could climb down inside Wolf Creek Crater. This is about one kilometre in diameter, making it the second biggest meteorite crater in the world. It's still there because the crust of Australia, Aboriginal people know, is the oldest crust on the earth today, as you get to that edge of Western Australia. Now, I went out there with an astronomer and geologist Gene Shoemaker and Aboriginal friends. And what they shared, the astronomer and the Aboriginal storytellers, was memorable. To Gene Shoemaker, this was a heavenly body that had fallen to earth. But he was a man that had taught himself how to listen and to empty his head of his own intellectual pretense and to be open to a new way of describing what was before our eyes. The Aboriginal people tell a story of a watery star that fell to earth at the place they call Kandimalo. Gene Shoemaker said to the Aboriginal storytellers, do you know that most comets are watery? They are mainly ice. And he said, my belief is that it was the comets and the ice that quite possibly brought the mysterious mixing, the alchemy that created life itself on Earth. The Aboriginal people smiled and said, it was a watery star that fell to Earth. And Jean smiled because he knew they were all struggling for words to explain something we don't fully understand, but this connecting of knowledge it's beautiful, it's powerful. And for a man as gifted as Gene Shoemaker, whose wife's name was on that Shoemaker-Levy comet, this was a man who was steeped in science, but open to listening and learning from those that truly love this place. As you travel the country, you will come across many places that have story and knowledge expressed through Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island art that is so old, it shatters any possible delusion that Europe is the bastion of knowledge and learning. Because long before the pyramids were built, long before Ulag Beck, that uh, medieval astronomer that created one of the world's first observatories in that beautiful city of Samarkand in Uzbekistan. He had actually charted the heavens before Galileo had the telescope. And long before all of the sacred books or the first books of European culture and knowledge, here in this great south land, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people had use this knowledge. This is what I say to the cultural war warriors. Can you explain to me how these civilizations endured through an ice age, through extraordinary loss of species and change to vegetation and food supplies, other than being adaptable, resilient? Aboriginal culture has always been adaptable. It doesn't need renovating by anthropologists. It needs listeners like Gene Shoemaker. We all need to tune our ears, to be silent long enough, to empty our heads of old thinking, to see what this extraordinary knowledge system has to offer us of great value now with a world that is out of kilter. I go to a place with my family almost every year, I have for the last nine years, to a gathering of Jarwin songmen that we call Walking with Spirits. It's at Beswick Falls, which is a beautiful place, about 120 kilometres southeast of Catherine, 
in the Northern Territory. And you walk in through a paperbark forest. You cross a creek that's alive with black, black brim and there are barramundi over there in the lake by the waterfall. And the campfires are on the sandy shore of this lake. And the dancers are dancing in a place that they've danced for 20,000 years or more. And nearby, the rock art tells us, they've probably danced for far longer and met because there are other places that are not right in the zone of this uh, seasonal flood that sweeps away everything and does rearrange everything on the map. Here in this place, where you watch the Jilpin Arts, this is the company created by the Aboriginal actor, musician, storyteller, Tom Lewis. You will see the men and women keeping alive ancient stories that have great value today. You can camp there yourself, you can listen to the old men and women, and you'll watch the way that Tom Lewis positions the old people to share what they know with their children and grandchildren, or my children and yours. It's a place to learn, to listen. And here, the coming and going has gone on for thousands and thousands of years. It's not fixed sense of culture. It's openness to extraordinary sharing of knowledge. This is the human knowledge system. As Mandela says, it's never been white or black. It's human knowledge. And culture works the same way. It's alive with interchange. So you might be there one year and you will see dance and corroboree. You will see theatre. You will see short films and animation, puppetry, or even fire displays of burning animal figures up there on these sandstone cliffs. But the shadows of those dancers projected on this sandstone amphitheatre are the same shadows that have been there for 20,000 years or more. And if you look up into that night sky, up into what Tom Lewis calls my cathedral, you'll see Gulumbu Unipingu stars. The stars bring me to the depth of what this exhibition is offering us, to the complexity of what Aboriginal art and culture is offering us. Gulumbu Yunapingu stars, in fact, were handed to her as a motif that was actually the background in some of her father's paintings. But she took that and filled the bark with our universe. And each tiny star you'll see has an eye because as a child out under a cloudless sky one night, she felt raindrops. And her mother said, the stars must be crying. So each star has an eye. And Gulumbu said, the stars to her are not only our Milky Way. I looked at the painting and I was thinking of all the knowledge Jean Shoemaker had shared with me, of my father-in-law who sent uh, a spacecraft out there looking for the aftermath of the Big Bang. I was thinking of the stars. And Gulumbu said, this is also about people because the stars you can see are us, the ones that you know. But those fainter ones, like the stars that we don't even know much about at all, are like all of those other people who we don't quite touch or reach or even see, but they exist on this marvellous blue planet spinning through space. This was Gulumbu Unipingu's sense of the universe. It was the connectedness of people, a beautiful, powerful connectedness of everything that has ever been, that exists now, or will exist into the future. It is abstraction, 
but it has a living, important human value. It is these ideas that we humans use to try to express the unfathomable things, the things that words just don't do justice to. Sometimes we paint them, we film them, we dance them, we sing them. And all of this is expressed through Aboriginal art. Wandering with Kim and our children when they were very small, this big, they're big, tall teenagers now, we were in Central Australia once with an extraordinary Aboriginal storyteller, a Pitanjara fellow, Dickie Mintian Terry, and his wonderful wife, who sadly has passed away. And they were leading us through the trees, and the old lady was pointing out to my little girl, Claire, the tree where she had been born. I saw moments like this in Hetty's series, where Hetty stopped and you forgot there was a film there. It was just this intimacy of the way Warwick Thornton filmed this and listened and of Hetty's warmth with this person. And that's what I saw at that moment of my little girl. Claire was more concerned that the old lady's feet were cut and bleeding. And for years she talked about the old lady should have had shoes because she told Claire she'd never owned shoes. She was a very poor woman. Out ahead, Dickie, Minty and Terry was leading my little boy, Will. And they went into a very mysterious place, a cave with layers of art and storytelling that go back to the beginnings of human history, through the longer timelines of Australian history. In this cave, there were thousands and thousands of years of stories painted over the top of other stories. Some reworked, some touched up, some kept alive, others that had faded into the walls of this cave. And from this cave, Dickie told us how as a child he'd looked out and seen his first white fella, the first white people who arrived in that area came on horseback. And what we were seeing was uh, a figure of a human and an animal fused into one. It was like one of Sid Nolan's Ned Kelly's on horseback. And Dickie said, it was the first gubber I ever saw. The gubbers were the white ghosts that floated into the lives of Aboriginal people. And he said, but we painted this story too. And here were the recent stories of the arrival of white people in the heartland. It is the responsibility of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists to also record what we have denied or erased or refused to understand about what happened, not only in the heartland, but in what is now our cities and in our towns. Because the Aboriginal artist has a role to bring the truth to us, the true stories that otherwise we might turn away from or become comfortably numb to until we deny that these things ever happen. So for me, the power of Aboriginal art is expressed in many brilliant forms today. When I see Bangara's Stephen and David Page creating what is a dance story art form, conveying the truth of things, especially in a wonderful work like Mathena. This is a story of an Aboriginal girl pulled between two worlds until she breaks. An Aboriginal playwright, Richard Franklin, did that to me when he wrote Conversations with the Dead. This was an extraordinary play that came out of his experience as a field investigator for the Royal Commission into Black Deaths in Custody. And Richard was gathering the stories from grieving families who had lost someone this way. And he got to that point where he wanted to take a noose and put it around his neck, but he didn't. He wrote an amazing story. A, a, a play so powerful 
that when Kim and I sat in that small Belvoir theatre years and years ago, I wanted the walls of that theatre to blow away and I wanted our country, I wanted everyone to hear the truth of that film, of that uh, play, of that story, of that true story. And I said later to Wayne Blair, the actor who was performing Richard's story, that he had captured that so powerfully, he made us understand. I know any of you who watched Warwick Thornton's Samson and Delilah would feel the same way. When Delilah approaches the table full of people in Alice Springs and they look right through her, they turn away from her in her pain. The truth is that Warwick in that great art expression is able to make us listen. We can't turn away. We have to understand who Samson and Delilah really are. I came out of that film, much as I did after seeing Richard Franklin's Howling at the Moon or cussing what our country had allowed to happen. If you saw Ivan Sen's beautiful film, Beneath Clouds, that photography, the artistic ability to be able to set contemporary life above a sacred burial ground or a massacre field or a place where something had happened before. And what Ivan's beautiful storytelling is doing is making us see, making us listen, teaching us how to see and listen. This is art and soul. This is what the paintings, the storytelling, the film, the play, the gifted musician, the living performance is sharing with us now. And it is of great value. These are personal feelings I'm sharing with you. My collaboration with Aboriginal artists extends into many different fields because I see value. It has been important to me. It is a way of seeing, a way of being that will make you a stronger human being that will make you feel more alive, that will make you value every precious day because it connects you to others and to all the life that is around you. I look for ways to let these stories conveyed by people, like the ones you meet in Art and Soul, to try to bring these stories to the world. That's what I was doing in New York, carrying the stories, the Aboriginal voices that I can to others to share in this, this treasure that we have here, this living, breathing knowledge system. So in little ways, there are things that we can all do to tap into that, to lend a hand, to bring these stories out, to see this happen. Often it can be with children who are quite close to you. In this art gallery next week, there'll be the launch of a new series of children's histories. There are songs, iconic songs, that are painted by children and yet at the same time convey very valuable knowledge about Aboriginal culture and very important Australian history. It started with a bunch of friends, a publisher, Bernadette Waters of One Day Hill, and some musicians. And it was Kev Carmody and Paul Kelly who offered their song, from Little Things, Big Things Grow. And if you watch Hetty and Warwick's series, you will see at Kalkaringi, part of the story of Vincent Lingiari, that dignified, great Australian who really seeded the struggle for Aboriginal land rights in the walk-off at Wave Hill Station. So in this little book, which has a Gurindji language version, you will see the children painting the story, keeping through art the story alive, and you will see the song conveying the substance of what happened there. You can walk around that country near Wave Hill Station 
and still pass by the stone graves of Aboriginal men, women and children who were massacred in the last killing that took place up in that part of the north. And yet the story of From Little Things, Big Things Grow is a hopeful one. It's celebrating a great Australian, someone worthy of a national holiday, someone I wanted my children to know about at the youngest age. And it is the hope of those children of the sunrise that makes this story important. In this launch next week, there will be other songs as stories, as histories. Archie Roach, who sadly just had a stroke. He and Shane Howard were in Timber Creek up in northwestern Australia teaching young people and he had a very bad stroke. And Archie, I hope you get well soon because we truly want to see this book, his book, They Took the Children, on every library shelf, in every school library and I hope in every home. That little book, his soulmate and partner, Ruby Hunter, helped paint. She painted to the day that she died to see that story come to life. It's a beautiful, powerful story, and it's a hopeful one. It is about the children of the sunrise coming home to the arms of people that know them and love them and appreciate. And along with Archie's story, Shane Howard's anthem to Uluru, an anthem to Aboriginal rights, Solid Rock, Sacred Ground, is one of that series of stories. And Neil Murray's beautiful song that you will remember Christine Arnew singing, My Island Home. In each case, the children of the community paint the story. There is a language version, and that's important. And it's not about money, but any money that flows back from those books will flow to back to the education of those children. In this way, I have my faith in the children of the sunrise, tomorrow's sunrise. I've got great faith that our children working together can finish the unfinished business. These stories, this art, Aboriginal storytelling, connects all of us. It gives the world its view of us, it tells us what it truly is to be Australian. If you would like to continue any of this conversation, if you would like to hear more of it from Aboriginal people, which is what I would love to see you do, try and keep October the 29th clear. On that night at the Chevelle Theatre at Paddington, there is an extraordinary film, Our Generation, that gathers the voices of the heartland. It is Aboriginal elders, largely anonymous people, talking about what is happening now in their community. Afterwards, Rosalie Cuneth Monks and Janini Gondra, Rosie was the actress in the movie Jetta, the first colour film made in Australia. Janini Gondra and Rosie have just come back from Geneva where they carried in their message stick important truths to the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. This is a truthful film, and it's like a red hot poker into the conscience of this nation. I would urge you to try and see it, to listen, and then meet Rosie and Janini and other members of their families who will travel with them to share what they know with you. Thank you very much.